ridding yourself of all those tips and then discovering how you can find questions before you consume any more piece of content, find a question you have. How can I do that? How can I find an original idea? What does it really mean to be a thought leader in B2B? That's what we're here to find out. This is The Notorious Thought Leader, a podcast for B2B marketers who want to generate demand by creating content that builds credibility and thought leadership. In each episode, Aaron Balsa helps demystify thought leadership and uncovers how companies are using thought leadership to generate demand. Let's get started. My guest today is Ben Pines, Director of Content at AI21 Labs. Thanks for being here, Ben. Hi, thanks, Erin, for having me. Of course, I'm so excited to chat with you because I am really interested in exploring the intersection of AI and thought leadership. And since your company's homepage hero literally says, when machines become thought partners, I figured you would have some excellent insights to share. But first, I'm going to ask you the same question that I ask every guest who comes on the show. What the fuck is thought leadership? That's a good question. <laughs> I think thought leadership is a lot of the times misunderstood. And I think it, it comes down to which perspective you, you try to cope with it. If you're into like getting sales and traffic and you see it as a medium, like let's do thought leadership. I think that's the wrong situation. Okay. So basically anyone who's working in a company in high tech, there's a lot you need to do. There's like the overwhelm of working in high tech. Okay. You need to operate in a new environment, a new technical environment, new technology stuff is happening all the time. So you need to adjust to that. You also need to operate in that environment, like be productive and work about and generate stuff. For your work and you also need to network and build a community around you so there's so much to do and i think some people just forget about all that responsibility and just think about writing linkedin posts so they can build their personal brand and be thought leaders so that's the wrong thing but if you see thought leadership sort of a strange side effect of all the things all the points i just mentioned then you can see how powerful it is. It's kind of like being a mentor only for a lot of people because of the mediums. So to be a mentor, you do need to do a lot of work. You need to work and become the expert, become, be, become the person that people want to mentor for. So you do the work and then being a mentor or being the thought leader, it's kind of the side effect. Okay. I, that's interesting. It reminds me a little bit of the conversation we had prior to right now recording. I had asked you, do you believe that you need to be a subject matter expert to be a thought leader? I ask every guest that same question before they come on the show. Some say yes, some say no, and you said yes. So I'm just wondering, you know, doubling down into the whole bit about developing that subject matter expertise. Why did you say yes? Why do you think that you have to be a subject matter expert to be seen by others as a thought leader? You know, there are certain levels of subject matter expertise. And you know, there's even a bias. I forget the name, but there is an, even a bias, a beginner's bias, where as a beginner, you think you know more than you do. So you, you're likely to consider yourself a subject matter expert way before you actually become one. But if you think of the levels, so when you're starting out in a certain industry, okay, you're certainly going to need to become a thought leader or to become an industry expert. You're going to first need to have the basic thing you're known as, like Gary V is known for repurposing content or Seth Godin is known for, you know, market like creative marketing ideas. So that's the big thing. So for that, you need to work for years to, to develop, but there's also the smaller things like, for example, I like to follow Ali Abdal on YouTube. And I think that his videos, what makes it very special that 
he does, deals a lot with productivity. He, his overarching thought leadership could be seen as productivity related. But every episode he makes, it's sort of a thought leadership on that topic. So if he's doing it on how to remember more of what you read, it's like he manages to create a thought leadership piece. And he manages to do that by actually not following best practices, by sharing a unique way of seeing, a point of view of seeing things. And this way it doesn't have to, you don't have to spend 10,000 hours to become subject matter expert. You can dive really deep into something or share deeply some personal experience about something. And, and then you might be perceived for that specific topic as, as someone who can, you know, talk about it. I think I saw a TED, a recent TED video about a subject matter expert on the topic of speed reading. And it's okay. such, such a small, such a technical topic, like eye movement and all that. But again, the topic is trendy enough. I guess you could use it as your expertise and maybe get enough business from it and, you know, build a career around it. Yeah. You know, I had Shima on the show to discuss thought leadership recently. And one thing that she said that was really interesting, she said, you can have a thought leader. You can be a thought leader in any space. You can have a thought leader in paper making. You can have a thought leader in the sex industry, right? So like what you're an expert on or what people view you as a thought leader on could be anything. It's so vast. And I underlined what you said here about not following best practices. That's really, to me, what helps you be seen as a thought leader faster, right? So thought leadership is different to everyone. You could put out excellent, well-researched content where you're interviewing different subject matter experts and you're showing examples. And, you know, if you produce enough of this really high quality expert fueled content over a long period of time, you can help your brand be seen as a thought leader by others. However, that's kind of the slow path. And today, in my opinion, that's like table stakes for good content, right? So you should be doing that for all of your content. How you fast track yourself to become a thought leader would be to, you know, like Steve Watt from Seismic said it so perfectly. And I just wanted to share again for the listeners. You are a thought leader when you illuminate a new destination that people have not seen before, or when you illuminate a new way to reach a familiar destination. You know, and he had shared an example of Chris Walker as a great thought leader in the marketing space because, you know, Chris isn't just telling us these are five ways to, you know, generate demand. He's actually, like Steve said, changing the way a whole generation of marketers do marketing helping people see there's a different way to, you know, different way to generate demand instead of capturing demand, a different way to measure things like thinking outside of traditional marketing attribution software. So for me, that really emphasizes what you said. It's not following best practices. It's just having these original ideas, original frameworks and things like that. And by the way, that thing that you hinted at, the beginners think they know more than they do. That's called the Dunning-Kroger effect. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I've actually read about that quite a bit. And I think that when you are a beginner, you should definitely keep an open mind. And this is why I'm doing this show. I want to kind of like collect as much information as possible from smart people to inform my thinking on the subject of thought, thought leadership and share it with the listeners and help others just keep an open mind and a growth mindset. And I think that's, that's something we should really all be doing in life. Yeah, for sure. And I think it boils down to basically, you mentioned Chris Walker, and I think he has such a growing following of people who actually go and follow what he's saying. Yeah. Okay. And he's saying a lot of things about attribution and he gives out a lot of practical advice. Okay. So people go out and try out his ideas and he knows that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if that gives a lot of responsibility because he could succeed uh, like getting attention and giving out tips and people use it. But if eventually people use it and it doesn't work, that will backfire. You know, people will come back angry and it happened a lot in the past that this actually happened. And these people ended up being perceived as hacks 
So that's the, you know, double-edged sword of thought leadership. So again, everything you do will eventually be uh, practiced and seen if it works. And this is a good litmus test to what you're doing because there's so many people and now also AI that, gen that is generating things that sound logical, sounds like good advice, but it in, in the real world, it, nobody does it. Nobody actually follows those best practices and those tips. And that's why there, there's, if, you're, if you've been around content for enough time and marketing for enough time, you know how to use your bullshit detector <laughs> to sort of know what, are the, what is the advice that is outstanding and really is like what Seth Godin calls it, I think, magical, that you, you hear it and you instantly want to try it. And one is just, you know, the same things that you see over and over again, how to find ideas for TikTok videos and those sort of types of content pieces. Yeah. And those are important too, right? You need that beginner education stuff out there in the world so that beginners can educate themselves to do the thing. But then those of us who are already doing the thing, we don't want that. We want like next level things are going to shape our thinking. And that's kind of like why you need the basic educational content. And you also need different types of content, depending on who you're speaking to and who your audience is. I'm not sure. I have to tell you, because I think a lot of the times what Okay, what are the problems with thought leadership? One of the biggest problems is what you call the consumer content uh, mindset, which is when you're a beginner and you start watching the videos and every video leads to another video and you sort of get addicted to consuming content and this is not healthy and you get it so with you know, this was true back in the days of YouTube, but now in TikTok, when it's just those tips are changing every five seconds, it's really an overwhelm. It's really an addiction to consuming content. And the way out of it is not easy, but it's possible. It's, there are many ways to do it. One way is just to take like a cleanse, like take a month off of everything, like no Maybe just write, read literature, like nothing that is even not books, nonfiction, no podcasts, and just reading yourself of all those tips and then discovering how you can find questions before you consume any more piece of content. Find a question you have. How can I do that? How can I find an original idea? Hmm, I like that. And it's definitely addictive. I have not really branched into TikTok yet just because I'm afraid of how addictive it could be and I just don't have the time you know but my kids are even they're small and they're already like this morning they were eating strawberries at the breakfast table and my daughter who's sick she's like oh do you know what mom I'm gonna grab a straw because I saw on YouTube that you can take the stem of a strawberry off with a straw so <laughs> here are my kids six and eight years old using oh, straws to like de-stem their strawberries because they saw it on YouTube that's scary like you know imagine how that's gonna kind of grow and i said you guys like was it kids that were teaching you how to do that because no adult would ever do that because we all know how difficult it is to clean crap out of straws so like if you were a grown-up <laughs> you would just use a paring knife now we have this new generation of people who are going to be using straws and then struggling to clean the strawberry out of their straws so like this abundance of tips and education can be bad, right? There's better ways to do things. I could have chopped off that green thing if you asked me in two seconds, and then I would have saved myself the time I'm going to spend later today doing dishes and cleaning all that strawberry crud out of the straws. So I, I get what you're saying. Exactly. Like not enough is done of how do you decide what content will help you tomorrow and in the next month producing that project and getting results, getting leads, getting sales. And what is just great advice, but not that important. Maybe it's not that important to take the Pomodoro technique <laughs> and apply it just tomorrow. Maybe it's better to take the landing page you wanted to deliver. Productivity also and thoughts can also be time wasters. That's mm. a fact. Yeah. 
So shifting a little bit to AI. So I, I like a lot of the stuff that you write on LinkedIn. That's how I became aware of you. And just yesterday you posted something that I thought was worth mentioning today. So you said the end is near for new age influencers, for spiritual coaches, and for instant gurus. Chat GPT will replace all the benign advice makers. Only the real thinkers will remain. It will happen fast. So there's a lot to unpack here in this one post. But first, could you explain in really simple terms what is Chat GPT for listeners who don't know? So basically, Chat GPT, this is from OpenAI, who also created GPT-3. And actually, it's not different in terms of the algorithm from the latest GPT-3 release. I think it's GPT-3.5. It's not that different. The, it's just a better interface. So you have an interface where it's like chat. So that's why it's very accessible and easy to use. Yeah, and it produces really, uh, I would say, uh, results. So typically people are really familiar with GPT-3 tools like J well, Jasper AI, Copy AI, those like really pretty big brand tools. They all use GPT-3 technology, correct? Yes. Well, our tool, which is one of the leading tools for AI writing, which is WordCube, is actually built on our own models of AI21 labs. So there aren't a lot of companies who are producing these types of large language models, but I think we're one of the only companies who are, who produce the, the models themselves, but also a, a successful, two successful products, Wordtune and Wordtune Read. So yeah, you have for these types of products, you have to have the models to, to build on them. And when you're talking about a better interface, so I've tested like most of these tools, I try to understand where they're at in terms of output and quality. So I've tested all of these on numerous occasions. And I noticed that WordTune, which your company makes, it has like a browser extension, right? So is that what you're meaning by like a better interface? It's kind of like more easy to use where you're already working. That's not exactly what I mean. Okay. So tools like. WordTune and Jasper and Copy AI, all those tools, they are, they are products. They have their own interface. OpenAI is much like AI21 Labs. This is the solution for these types of NLP based apps. So it's different. The reason why OpenAI has this interface is kind of to show possible developers and people who can take this technology forward, how to use, how to use it. And that's why they created chat GPT. It's not a product. Okay. Interesting. It's not a product. It is an interface. Is that what you're saying? It, it, yeah. It's an interface that uses one of their NLP and by the way, NLP is natural language processing. It uses the GPT three, uh, model. Okay, cool. Thanks for explaining. I know some of us are still trying to wrap our heads around all this technology and how it works. So, you know, you said only the real thinkers will remain. So why is real thinking an essential part of content creation? Yeah. So this kind of brings us back to what we talked earlier. So basically I tested the chat GPT for a few prompts and I was on the one hand, very impressed that, you know, any question it really provided sort of what you would expect when you search Google for uh, any tips or advice on this sort of listicles and how to's giving you sort of a best practice paragraphs. And this is fine. And again, this also is, this might be used to get traffic and build even your reputation. I don't know, build your following on, on social media on one level. On the other level, if you understand what has happened in SEO in the past few years, you know, all the algorithms change and adapt both on social media and search engines, they adapt. And once you have technology, you don't only have Fiverr freelance writers producing these articles for $5. You also have a machine doing it. It means 
it, it just means a scaling of these sort of articles. And they're great. They can even help you in some sort of way. Let's say you want to find ideas to get to sleep. Okay, so the large language models, they are able to produce a reasonable article giving you a few tips. The different, the thing that it's still not spectacular content, meaning it's not a book by Seth Godin. It's not <laughs> something that you read it and it changes your mind and you are going to, you know, immediately implement it and it's going to be different. So this is something that writer that I really like, Jay Akanzo, has been writing about for the past few years. It's how to get out of, even before AI, he was talking about it, how to get out of the generic and best practices and how to create something that people really care about. And there's a lot to unpack what it means to be this, you know, idea person, but it's clear that this kind of content will become a, a much more valued currency than it currently is. So if you think of this, a similar thing happened with Instagram. So Instagram came out. And photographers was, were saying, yeah, are, they, are we going to replace photographers? And no, there are still photographers. Only if you're a mediocre photographer producing mediocre, then the app can replace you. But the spectacular photographers are going to succeed even more because someone will look at the photograph and instantly see this couldn't have been produced by the app. The same will happen for textual AI. Someone will read the text, see the visuals, see the screenshots, see experience, the stories, and will say, yeah, this wouldn't be possible with AI. That's interesting. I say a lot that, you know, this generic content, it's just vanilla. You know, you could hire a hundred people and they could all produce this basic kind of vanilla educational content, whether that's a blog post, a photograph, whatever. And I think that, you know, as we have these tools and these AI capabilities to lean on, it becomes more important than the style and taste of these different creatives, right? So sometimes it's their thinking, like Jay Akunzo, Seth Godin. There's a lot of people who are leading the way by having these really original leading thoughts. And then there are some people who are you know, they're not trying to be thought leaders, but they're exceptional creatives and they have a certain sense of style and taste that clients are drawn to that they feel cannot be replicated today with current AI capabilities. So, you know, I've always said, you know, I haven't always said, I'm constantly changing my opinion <laughs> as I learn more and as technology evolves, but I feel like, you know, technology and AI has already replaced the bottom half of the market. I've said this many times, but I had a stance that AI can never replace humans entirely. And then I've had some friends kind of counter argue that, and I wanted to read one, one post to you. So you really? a while back I had posted basically that, and I had a lot of people weigh in on the topic. The post ended up getting like 60,000 impressions. So it's Obviously a topic that writers and content professionals care deeply about and want to learn about. So, so I had said this essentially like, oh yeah, AI can already replace the bottom of the market, but they'll never be able to come up with original thoughts and they'll never be able to, you know, write a research report because that involved thinking, connecting the dots. And I had some people be like, well, yes, it will because, and here I want to read you this exact post so you can respond to it. So this is from Corrales Cashola, and he said, the current AI tools are just the MVPs. They get better progressively based on feedback loops. Unlike humans, AI are running these MVP models 24-7, 365. They can improve in one day what a team of writers could not improve in one year because an AI never sleeps, doesn't eat, doesn't need creative breaks, doesn't get into arguments with other writers, clients, bosses, spouses, or kids, and is always hungry for more. The fact that AI is already writing news stories means they are capable of writing at any level imaginable. It's only a matter of time. CPU power and the data sets they are fed. I'm curious to get your reaction to that comment. 
it's very okay. So I wrote a piece about this, and it's very important to understand how this technology works. So AI was actually something back in the eighties, but then it was very different. Back in the eighties, AI, the way they built AI was basically to build like maps. They interviewed like professionals, like doctors, saw how their decision tree worked and tried to replicate it using the same trees of decision-making. Okay, and that kind of died and there were years of quiet in AI and then it went back into interest when neural networks started appearing and the way the current models work is basically with prediction models. So you have a sentence and the model can predict the next word because it, you feed the model all of the internet, all of the textual reservoirs, the internet, books, etc. It eats everything up and then it can, it makes billions of like 170 billion and more, it's growing all the time, parameters to sort of have scales, what is the prediction of the next word? And according to this technology, these prediction methodologies, it's able to produce these art full articles that sound human and interesting. And there are several problems with it. I won't go into detail, but one of the problems is that it's not thinking, like it doesn't understand basic human reasoning and how the world works. And this can get some improvement, but I don't know. I have a personal analogy. I see it like it can write you a post on how to make an omelet, but it didn't make an omelet because it has no arms. Okay. And eventually you're talking about the reader. They want to follow the person that tried to make an omelet, broke a few eggs and tasted it and used everything that humanity brings to the table. And this is true for pretty much every topic. So it's important for the person as well to know that it's written by a human who tried it and is giving their own personal details. So I think there's a lot of perspectives, how you can understand why it's not going to replace humans and it's only going to change. You can also look back at history because this happened many times before on different, with different technologies, but I'm optimistic. And another thing is there are different ways this technology is developing. One way is I'll take writing specifically. Okay. So one way you can think of it is just generate lazy articles. You click a button, you tell it what you want. I want an article on omelets. You click a button, you have the article. What is the value of this article in your authorship, in your being pr producing this and in someone reading your content? I think it, it's not much, but the way Wordtune works, which also uses AI is as a writing assistant. So when you're writing, you have, you constantly have thoughts in your mind and you need to put them down on paper. So you put something down. Sometimes it's not the first thing that comes to mind is not the most articulate. It's a bit like Yoda talk, uh, you know, so you spew the thing that you have in your mind. And what's nice about WordTune is it produces alternatives that you can choose from. And actually our mind works, our recall is much worse if you try to remember something, it's much worse than our recogn recognition. When our memory works that we can recognize much better than we can pull information from our memory. And this is why WordTune is so successful because you write down something general, then you get alternatives that are phrased better. Your mind can recognize the better version of the topic of the sentence and it can really help non-natives or even natives and people who write for a living. And that's why our product is, you know, yeah, it's exploding because I think this is the future of having a writing assistant. This is a much better way of thinking about this technology. Yeah. Cause then it's your expertise, your first person stories that you can share just polished up as if you had an editor by your side. 
You know, my husband, he's from Portugal, moved here as an adult, so he's a non-native speaker, but he has to communicate all the time at work in English and in other languages, and it's really hard. So I could picture this being like a great tool for someone like him. He's not a writer, but he has to constantly write emails and presentations, and I could see it being really helpful for polishing. You know, I used to run an all-company monthly writing workshop, and I would invite anyone from any department in the company to come into the learning center and learn how to improve their writing. And I used to have some people, you know, like engineers or an engineering leader who, you know, he's mathematically minded. He's not, you know, a writer in any sense, but he had to communicate clearly in written form so that he could communicate cross-functionally across the organization. And he cared a lot and he showed up every month to try to improve his writing. And I feel like someone like that could really benefit from a tool because he's brilliant and he just needs a little bit of polishing, right? So this is a tool that's helpful beyond just content creators. For sure. Yeah. Love that. So I'm not sure if you really answered this or not, but I'm going to ask again, just to be clear, something that I personally love to do and I do a lot of is conducting survey-based research and then writing research reports. So again, connecting the dots, trying to understand what these data points are telling and how, you know, they overlap and creating a story, doing data storytelling. Do you feel like at any point AI will be able to do that? You'd be able to kind of input a spreadsheet of, you know, cleaned data points, and then AI could just spit out a whole, you know, 30 page research report. Do you see that possibility? It depends what kind of research report, but yeah, definitely this is one of the, let's say the exciting developments of this technology, being able to take data and generate a whole bunch of reports, and this is all of the technical writing is going to be very much transformed by this technology. And let's face it, this is right. The type of writing that people are not keen on doing anyway. Like uh, I'm talking about, uh, you know, financial reports and all that. So this can be the writing and the reading of these types of bureaucracy and all that will be, I hope it will be transformed and, and improved and we're talking legal writing and technical writing and manuals and all of these things. I think this is the first types of industries that are going to be transformed. Yeah. I've read a lot of the, or haven't read, I've scanned a lot of those really boring stuffy reports. And I definitely think that there's not really a lot of writing. A lot of times it's really just kind of dry, like this is what the facts say. So I could definitely picture a world where AI comes into play. I hope that a lot of the reports that some listeners might be working on, they do a really good job storytelling. So maybe that would be a little bit harder to, and storytelling with personality, right? So like we all know today, reports don't have to be stuffy and formal. There are a lot of people and companies doing an excellent job adding some personality and even a little bit of like humor sometimes into reports because Like you said earlier, it's about breaking the rules. You don't always have to fall in line and write reports a certain way just because that's how it's always been done. You can be intelligent and build credibility and still have a personality. At least that's how I feel. So we're coming up on time. Thank you so much, Ben, for coming on the show. If listeners wanted to follow you and your work, what's the best way for them to do that? You can follow the WordTune blog. And also follow me on LinkedIn, Ben Pines. Awesome. We'll add the links to the show notes. Thanks so much, Ben, for coming on the show and have a great day. Thanks, Erin. It's been fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Notorious Thought Leader. If you're looking for more stories from marketers who are generating demand from thought leadership, then visit us at motionagency.io slash notorious. See you next time.